there is a tendency in photography, not only in photography, I, mean, I think in many arts, to label people, you know, what is doing, what it doesn't do. And then one of the things that's been labeled to me is the war photographer uh, label. And I really disagree completely with the with kind of expression because I, I'm not a war photographer. I don't know even what, what is a war photographer. Uh, I've been with my camera, with my assignment, many times in conflict. I think I'm just a photographer. Alex Maioli, a Magnum photographer since 2001, upholds a free vision without precise confines which respects the fundamental principles of realism, emotional expression, and instinct. But at the same time, each of his photos shows a scientific scrupulousness in the choice of his subjects and in the stories he narrates, and into which he fully immerses himself as an observer and protagonist of the scene. Maioli's research is a continuous research, often even unknown and extremely personal, which has taken him from psychiatric institutions to South America, from Albania to featureless lives, oppressed by violence and often forgotten in war theaters of recent years, with photos which have earned the approval of the press and induced reflection, like the photo at the coffin of a young American soldier torn from life by the conflict in Iraq. Iraq war, the Pentagon, uh, they embed the photographer and journalist with them. So I think there was a, a lot of materials coming out from the invasion. And I think only Vietnam was before another war with a lot of access. You know, I remember in Iraq, you know, it was, uh, it was easy to really like catch up with a, a unit or a convoy and say, where are you going? And, well, we go in Tobars, Najaf, uh, whatever, I, I come with you. And, you know, you just need a, a pass, you know, a press. Uh, a press uh, accreditation that you get in, a, in a Kuwait, I mean, it's not really a, such a big issue. They were carrying you in helicopters uh, everywhere, I mean, you could, you could witness everything they were doing easily. The war, which opened with an invasion of the willing, as former President Bush defined it, at dawn on March 20th, 2003, was baptized as a preventive war for the exportation of democracy. Saddam Hussein was accused of hiding weapons of mass destruction and supporting Al-Qaeda forces. In just 21 days, he will be removed from power and Baghdad will be conquered. It will be one of the conflicts most documented by television crews and photo reporters. But the Iraqi people will continue to live with foreign troops, enduring attacks and aggression from local conflicts for another nine years. It's difficult with an image uh, tells what's going on uh, because there is no sound or movement. There is many things going on. The emotions is really difficult to. I mean, actually, the only thing you can capture are ritual, the ritual of the war, the emotion. Sometimes you are good, but and the event. You know, if there is someone. A dead body in the field, you can only take a picture, but it does represent that, you know. It's not like because you photograph someone shooting, oh, you are at war, or someone that is dead in the floor, is, you are at war. War is made of many things. The, the things happen around me when I'm some, sometimes in conflict are so big and so, so complicated, so, so huge that the photography is not enough to represent those. Um, Starting from my own emotion, my fears, my 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 encounters, and that's where is a uh, fun stranger when I come back home and look at the picture and say, yes, what it is all about. That is always a question. What it is all about, you know? Someone shooting, yeah, you can go with uh, some uh, some hunter in the forest and have the same kind of picture, you know? It doesn't really tell you anything. Someone shooting with the Kalashnikov, what, you know? Thank you.
Maioli's first photos concern the lost lives of the youth in the venues of the Romagna Riviera. But over the years, he will also develop a passion for the rehabilitation of lives abandoned to their fate. Like for the homeless shelters in Basalia, and again for the insane asylum in Leros, he expresses the drama of the deprival of every form of human dignity. I, I work for many, I mean, I was um, just a photojournalist working for a, a Grazianerian agency in Milan. I was really, really young. During a dinner in, uh, in, the, in this place, I was staying near Bologna, and uh, I was having dinner, I was a dinner and say, it was a lot of people. It was this Belgian girl, of oh, French, I don't remember, sorry. Uh, and you say, oh, but, but what are you doing? Well, I work, I work in a psychiatric hospital. And then I end up to be uh, one of these, um, you know, the Basalians. Um, and in Imola, they start this project. Uh, she was working in this thing, so I've, I start to be uh, attracted by this uh, philosophy. By, it was impressive. These mad people are coming up from the psychiatric hospital and walk in the city. And I start to fall, I fall in, fell, I fell in love with the, the ideology. There were this thing happening in Leros, where uh, where they've been called to work there and close the madhouse in Leros, which is actually what has been considered in the past one of the worst in the world. And uh, people naked, that's just horrible. From there to. To the to the um, to the freedom to they, they closed the medals you know after not not took maybe five years six years so I follow up a little bit the pro the process the mad people is a, a fantastic subject aesthetically talking you know is is, is a cynic what I'm saying but uh, um, I di I never want to do a book and say to say oh look I'm good I'm taking picture of this uh, amazing uh, story. It was early in the morning. Uh, I was with this unit uh, that is the Marines unit they were uh, basically supplying food and munitions to the front line. So I, I felt really close to the front line even though I was tight with them, I couldn't go alone anywhere. So we wake up early in the morning and uh, it was also another unit where uh, it was a mobile um, uh, mesh unit, like a military hospital. They're moving really fast. They can put up an hospital in 40 minutes and put it down. So we were just trying to, we were approaching Baghdad and were a lot of, were, was a lot of things going on in Baghdad. And, um, and there were a lot of fighting in, uh, we were just 10 miles away and um, and not, it was really early in the morning this, I heard these two helicopters coming down um, landing and then uh, from the helicopter you know there are many I saw many helicopters in 20 days and been there and I was like but from the helicopter came out this uh, barrel with the uh, with the American flag on top and say wow that's that unusual what's going on and then uh, I ran I approached the helicopter you know it was it was a weird situation I mean we are in terms of, like the silence uh, nobody was talking it was kind of it was not a really uh, 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 it was something unique I would say uh, the ritual and was unique also because I think also the other soldiers the other would be surprised to see someone coming up from the flag under the flag and um, and nothing. I approach and just start to keep picture simply, tan tan tan. And there is this picture where there is many things going on in this picture. First of all, the American flag is the protagonist of the picture, the, the main subject, and the dead of the soldier. And the flag was f tried, was flying away from the, the body, and some and some soldier was putting putting back the flag. Uh, so it's, it's all the gesture, all the. Um, all the, and I think that picture represent a lot of things for, uh, for. You, you, there is a m multiple layers of interpretation of that picture. I have to say because when I saw that picture, 
uh, as an European, as an Italian, I was thinking many, I know, I was thinking like, uh, wow, you, you, you're dying in this war, you know? Um, so for me, it's like always like, In a moment of wavering, when his passion for photography begins to cause questions regarding his life, Alex Maioli sends a portfolio to the Magnum Agency, merely to ask for advice. It will be his pass card to the Board of Photographers, where he will contend with the great names in the international panorama. In 2011, when he was just 40, he was nominated as president of Magnum Photos. Well, I study hard, and then uh, I was working this uh, studio in Ravenna with uh, there were mainly two big masters. Uh, one is Daniele Casadio and the other is Ettore Malanque. One is more like portrait-oriented, uh, arty-oriented, I don't know how to define, which is my real master. The guy taught me everything when I was really young, I was working in this studio. And the other one is his master, which is called Ettore Malanque, which is a photojournalist. So I was really young and these uh, this, uh, stories that this uh, this photographer was, was narrating when he was coming back to the studio, etc., attracted me a lot. And uh, I think that was the, the idea, go with, on that pattern. So when I see a picture like this, uh, the idea is like, uh, is like um, you know, there is uh, an aspect uh, which is visual, is, uh, is uh, probably aesthetic, but at the same time, which I, I attract my eyes, and. Uh, uh, but at the same time, there is a caption behind this picture, content, uh, which doesn't matter, doesn't have to come out uh, as uh, important, but is, um, for example, this, uh, I'm in this, I shoot this picture from the office of uh, uh, Cardoso, the president for uh, Brazil, um, in Sao Paulo. So you, you can recognize Sao Paulo, you have the, the tropical information, you have the palms, you have, uh, and this curtain, which is obscure everything. That is like kind of, uh, is covering the office. Uh, of course, there are work in progress in the building, but you know, all the metaphor about that building, the office, the president, the way, the things he did as a president, you know. Brazil. Brazil uh, is a project that I'm working on since I since many years. At a certain point, I in 2004, I decided to went through all my contact sheet, all my pictures, and I, I, I discovered that I have more than just a series of assignments uh, or little stories, and I tried to re-edit and connect together these pictures uh, to see if there's something more. Yes, and, uh, and then there is a working title of this project, it's called Requiem in Samba. Uh, which I think is a, still a working title. I'm not quite sure about the title. Uh, you know, we have this, uh, this picture, which is a candomblé situation, you know, the Oshu, all the, all the, um, the, the Santeria, you call it in English, um, that has in Brazil. But at the same time, is, uh, if you read the, read, read the caption of this picture, have been taken when they were um, evicting uh, taking uh, from the, from a favela, they were like uh, uh, taking the people out from this favela because they needed for all this uh, renovation. Because the the, the work up, they have um, this uh, eviction. So uh, basically, they for for these events, the work up and the Olympic Games, they are cleaning the, this favela. So basically, they want to take the the smugglers, the dealers, the drug dealers away from the favela. This, for example, is a picture from Karanjiru. Karanjiru was, uh, I think, one of the biggest, uh, is the, was the biggest uh, prison in the world, I guess. They did also a movie about it. This comes from an assignment I did about the Karanjiru, a story I did inside. Then I picked the story, you see these guys, and then these guys. I mean, I, I tried to create the stories, with a, create a pattern that can 
picture after picture have a, a narrative. When I send that picture to the magazine thing, but they might not even publish this picture. But actually, you know, uh, the picture is, is in America is taking completely different uh, meaning, and uh, for them is a hero uh, dying for freedom. And yes, it is also that. It's, a, it's, a, it's one dying for freedom, and, so, and for maybe someone like me, as back, back, and a completely different background and culture, say, well, you're dying for, for nothing. So it's really like, uh, it's interesting. I, I like photography also for that, because you know, not necessarily, you can't you can just necessarily corrupt uh, an event. You, it's right there, you know. And the caption is really simple, like a felon comrade died for the Battle of Baghdad. I mean, that is true. Uh, but the people, the audience or the people read, uh, look at the picture, have a completely different feeling. If you would show the picture to an European or to an American, they publish double spread page, and have been used a lot, you know. So it could be could have different meaning the picture. So later, later on in the month and the years, actually, I find out who's under this this flag, and there's a, is a soldier called uh, Sergeant uh, uh, Garda. There is this guy basically. Uh, I got in contact with this guy, he started emailing me, say, "Well, I'm the helicopter. Uh, I'm the pilot of that helicopter. Uh, I really would like to have a print." I also, and then I start to ask, well, by the way, you know who was inside about the flag? And they told me the name of the guy. And then I sent the print to the family. Then they sent me a t-shirt. They did a t-shirt with his face. Yeah, one. He died 8, 13, April 8, in 2003, in the back of my ambulance. This is the, the guy driving the ambulance, uh, writing that. I just want to let the family and friends of know that he died in peace and did not suffer. Myself, along with two corpsmen, worked on him briefly, but realized he was in God's hand after a short period of time. We placed an American flag over his body before transporting him to the waiting Kesevac uh, helicopter. I will never forget them that morning and what you to know that I think of him just about every day. His death constantly reinforces how grateful I am for the freedom he died fighting for. I love him for that. So basically, I, I, I don't know, I go, take a picture and uh, do a story and then uh, fly back here. When I'm here, if you, that is the question, when I'm here, I'm really trying to not do that, do the, the minimum possible about photography. Like I edit, okay, but I'm connected, I'm Skyping with my assistant. Um, I try to do really family life. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna see me ever with a camera taking pictures in Amsterdam, never. <laughs> I'm in Kosovo for an assignment for Medicine Sans Frontier, and um, so I had some contact with them. I was working with the others, with the Medicine Sans Frontier. They told me they're open. So we ran with, uh, to the car and we drove into the village and, was, uh, and we found these still refugees coming out and then we end up to find um, 
And so we were asking what's happened with all these burning dogs, uh, empty village, and then was in a, in a anger, like, like kind of a big garage, between 36 to 42 bodies from this village, from mostly where Ashari family. And then was remember was really important um, picture, an important moment for the history of Kosovo because it was the moment where everything switched and the, and worse. Yeah, these are the bodies that I found. These are all these, uh, all these kids, everything. After this Prekas massacre uh, was the beginning of um, the official beginning of the war. Photography for me is all about the attitude, on, uh, the attitude you have uh, towards a subject, towards, towards a, a story, towards event, etc, uh, etc. Et so, so basically what, I, what I'm doing is really like put myself as a me, as, not as a, someone knows or uh, about the story. It's uh, sbagliato. Non riesco a spiegarlo... Cioè, il concetto, te lo spiego così. Il concetto è questo, cioè, quando... Quando fotografo, non, è come se per me sei in uno stage, capito? Come se sei in una situazione teatrale, cioè la vita è un teatro. E, e io faccio il fotografo in quella situazione, non faccio una cosa, non, non cerco di essere invisibile. Eh, è, come se, è come, faccio sempre questo esempio quando insegno. Se c'è un, un, un incendio, c'è cioè quello dentro la casa da salvare e c'è un pompiere, ok? e il pompiere è, fa, la, fa il pompiere quando c'è uno che sta male c'è il dottore e, e quando c'è un evento o c'è un, un fotografo cioè c'è un matrimonio ci sono quelli che si sposano c'è il prete o il sindaco e poi c'è il fotografo e quello è il teatro questa è la situazione quindi chi, chi va là e fa il fotografo non può fare nient'altro che quello non può essere ah faccio quello che non si fa vedere o quello cioè, il teatro è questo quindi anche quando vado a fare l'evento non cerco di capire o essere egiziano se sono a Tahir Square questo è il senso sono un italiano che vorrebbe mangiare alla sera bene e se ci fosse un bicchiere di vino sarebbe meglio questa idea che il fotografo deve andare a a, a, far, a essere testimone per il mondo oppure capire il malessere della gente o il benessere della gente per trasmetterlo perché no io credo che parte da, da una cosa molto più semplice cioè da una esigenza da, da un, il mio personaggio è il fotografo è pirandelliana la cosa capito cioè il fotografo c'è il dottore, c'è quello che sta bene, quello che sta male, c'è quello che tira i sassi e io faccio il fotografo che fotografa quello che mi ha Sembra una cosa così banale e semplice, ma quello è un atteggiamento. E io anche quando guardo le foto degli altri, ho le mie, cioè io voglio vedere l'atteggiamento della persona, non voglio vedere quanto è bravo a fare il fotografo, capito? non voglio vedere la tua abilità, voglio vedere tu dentro quella strada lì.